Hi. In this lesson, we're going to get into the voluntary liens and foreclosures. So in an earlier lesson, we actually talked about the involuntary and the voluntary liens. The involuntary liens were taxes and assessments and judgments and so on. Well, we're not going to talk about them today. What we're going to get into today are the voluntary liens, namely mortgages, deeds of trust, and land contracts. So let's get started. And the first term you want to know about is this term hypothecation. To hypothecate something is to place it up as collateral without giving up possession. So, for example, if you've ever financed your car, you're driving around in your car, but the bank holds the lien on the property, on that car. Well, the same thing is true with real estate. When you name your house or other property as collateral for a loan, you hypothecate it. You name it as collateral, but you keep possession. So, to hypothecate means to place something as collateral without giving up possession. That's compared to what would be a pledge or a pawn. If you pawn your jewelry or your tools, you give that to the lender, to the pawnbroker, and they hold that until such time as you've paid it back. But with real estate, you keep possession, and that's referred to as a hypothecation. We're going to talk about the three liens, the three voluntary liens, and the first one we're going to talk about is mortgages. Why mortgages? Well, mortgages are rarely, if ever, used anymore, but the mortgage law specifically talks about how a judicial foreclosure would go forward. So primarily, we're going to get into the terminology with mortgages. And in the Arizona material, in this material relating to foreclosures, what I want you to emphasize or think about is that when the term mortgage is used, we're specifically talking about a mortgage document. We're not using it in a generic sense any longer as we did in some of the financing discussions. When you see the term mortgage in the Arizona portion of the exam, we're talking about the legal document known as a realty mortgage. So let's talk about the documents. There are two. The first document is the promissory note. That's the IOU. The note, as we've talked about in a previous session, acknowledges the debt. It states the amount of the debt, the interest rate, the payment, the number of payments, and so on. And the note right, is not the same as the mortgage. The mortgage secures the note with the property. So the mortgage names the property as collateral. So there are two documents, the note, promissory note, and the mortgage. And who are the parties to a mortgage? Well, they are you got it, the mortgagor, the borrower, and the mortgagee. Now, this may seem a little bit counterintuitive because we've talked about always here that the mortgagor gives and the mortgagee receives. And you might think that this one is contrary to that. It's not. Let's talk about it. If you go to the bank and you want to borrow some money, the bank gives you the money, but you sign the note and mortgage and give the mortgage to the bank as collateral. So you, the borrower, are giving the mortgage to the bank as collateral. Therefore, you are the mortgage or the giver, and the bank is the mortgagee, the receiver. Now, if that's hard to remember, maybe you might remember it this way. The OR in mortgage or and the two O's in borrower might help or the two E's in mortgagee and the two E's in lender. In either case, make sure when you read a question that deals with mortgagor and mortgagee that you have them straight. So again, the mortgagor gives the mortgage, therefore the mortgagor is the borrower giving the mortgage to the bank. The mortgagee, the bank, receives the mortgage as the collateral. So again, the mortgagor gives, the mortgagee receives. Now, there's a term that we've discussed in the past called defeasance, and in the context of financing, defeasance means payoff. The defeasance clause, you might recall from a financing session, is a clause that says when the note is paid in full, the mortgage is defeated. So, equate defeasance with payoff. And, of course, it's derived from the word defeat. So the question becomes, what happens when a note and mortgage are paid off? 
Well, by law, in Arizona, the law requires the lender to deliver what is called a satisfaction of mortgage. A satisfaction of mortgage is required to be delivered to the borrower at payoff. And by law, it has to be delivered within 30 days of the payoff. If it's not delivered within that time period, then the borrower actually should notify the lender. And if the lender doesn't act within a reasonable time to deliver the satisfaction, the lender could actually be liable for some penalties. We won't go into what they are, but please realize that the mortgage, the satisfaction of mortgage, must be delivered to the borrower within 30 days of payoff. And the, when the borrower receives this, the borrower has the obligation to record it. What if the borrower does not record it? Well, then the mortgage still is of record. But by recording the satisfaction of mortgage, that removes the mortgage from the public records, or at least it indicates that the mortgage has been paid off, has been satisfied. Next question, what happens if default occurs? Remember, if you and I borrow money, there's really only two possible results. Either I'll pay it off or I'll default. Well, the next question is what happens upon default? And by definition, default is failure to comply with any of the terms in that note or mortgage. Now, years ago, when I first started teaching real estate in the 1970s, I started to define this term default, and all of a sudden, from the middle of the room, I heard this voice, wrong. Now, it was just that loud, and I couldn't believe it. So, taken aback, I, I asked the gentleman who said that, I said, well, can you elaborate on what you mean by that? So he went into some silly definition that he had in his mind of what default meant. All right, keep in mind, very simply, default means that the borrower has not lived up to one of the terms and conditions. Now, typically, that's they haven't made their payments, but it might be that they haven't paid the property taxes, or they haven't kept insurance current on the property, or even that they fail to maintain the property in reasonably good condition. So all of those are reasons why the borrower might be considered to be in default. So in a mortgage now, if default occurs, the lender's remedy is what is known as a judicial foreclosure. A judicial foreclosure. What does that mean? It means a court action. Let's take a look at the steps in a judicial foreclosure. So first and foremost, a judicial foreclosure is a caught action. And you'll see those dashed lines there on that diagram. Well, those dashed lines simply indicate whatever period of time it was up until the lawsuit begins. For example, lenders don't begin a foreclosure right away. It might be many months since the borrower made their last payment that the lend before the lender actually begins the foreclosure. So we don't really know how long it might take, how many letters might be sent out before the lender actually begins the lawsuit. But where we're, where we're going to begin our foreclosure is at the lawsuit. So the lender hires an attorney, the attorney files the papers in court beginning the lawsuit. At the same time, what is known as a list pendants is recorded. That red flags the property through the recorder's office to anybody searching the records that this property is in litigation, is in foreclosure. List pendens literally means litigation pending in Latin. At the same time, you'll notice it says there that the debt is accelerated. What does that mean? It means that the lender declares the entire balance on the loan immediately due and payable. They exercise that acceleration clause that we talked about. So now, once the lawsuit starts, and because the courts are quite crowded, it may take a long time before you actually get into court and have the case heard. So we don't know how much time that is. It actually could take a year or even more. But let's say we finally get into court, and then the court decides, I, for the lender, the court decides that the borrower is in default. And then what the court will do is order that the sheriff, as an officer of the court, conduct an auction. So the public auction that occurs on the steps of the courthouse in a judicial foreclosure is known as a sheriff's sale. And at the sheriff's sale, the property is sold to the highest bidder. 
and the bidder receives what is known as a sheriff's certificate of sale. Not a deed, but a sheriff's certificate of sale. So now what happens? Well, at this point, we begin what is known as a six-month statutory right of redemption. The law states the borrower has another six months, during which time, if they redeem the property, they pay all the money bid plus a penalty. And we're not going to go into what the penalty is, but basically pay the bidder all the money that the bidder bid plus some interest. Then they can reinstate themselves in the property. They're back in the saddle. The mortgage was paid off. However, if they don't redeem during that six months, at the end of the six months, the bidder comes back in, tells the sheriff the six months is over, and turns that certificate of purchase in, the certificate of sale in, and gets a sheriff's deed. So after this six-month redemption period, the sheriff delivers the sheriff's deed, transferring ownership to the high bidder. Now, two more terms we want to talk about here. The first is the period of time up to the sheriff's sale. That's an indefinite period of time because it, it takes a long time typically to get into court, and then the sheriff has to advertise the property and post it for sale. So we don't know exactly what that time frame is. So it's simply called the equity of redemption. During that period of time, the borrower can come in and redeem by paying, all the, by paying the loan off plus foreclosure costs. After the sale, by statute, by law, that borrower is still in possession of the property in all likelihood and has a six-month right of redemption. So after the sale, the bidder does not own the property. The bidder does not own the property. I said it twice. The owner still owns it, and if they were to come in after the sale during that six-month period, then and redeem the property, they pay all the money that the bidder bid plus this penalty that I mentioned, they own the property, they still own it. Once the six month passes and the sheriff's deed is delivered, then the bidder owns the property. All through this period of time, please realize, the owner of the property may remain in what's known as peaceable possession of the property. They can't be thrown out of the property unless unless they're causing damage to the property, and then the lender could go into court and ask the court to evict that owner because of the fact that they're damaging the property. So those are the basic steps in a judicial foreclosure. Now, in your course material, you do have this list here. Uh, uh, and again, please note prior at the bottom there, please, please note, <laughs> please note, Prior to the sheriff's sale, it's called an equity redemption, and after the sale, the owner has a statutory right of redemption. So that's it on a judicial foreclosure of a mortgage. Now, as we'll see as we go forward with more foreclosures, judicial foreclosure is available not only in a mortgage, but also in a deed of trust, and also in a contract for the sale of real estate. So this judicial foreclosure option is an option that all three of the voluntary liens have available for the lender. Now let's take a minute and talk about the bidding at this sheriff's sale. So first of all, the first possibility is that excess money would be bid. Let's explore that. Let's say we have a value in the property of $200,000. In other words, any, anybody who might have some knowledge about values would say the property in its current state at the time of foreclosure is worth $200,000. And let's say the first mortgage on it is only $100,000. Well, how many of you would want to bid $100,000 and acquire a property worth two hundred? dollars I'll raise my hand to that. I'm sure you would. So we might have a situation here where the other bidder, some other bidders would come in and bid above the $100,000 first mortgage. And let's say that happens. Let's say that someone comes in and bids $125,000. The first question is, well, the lender gets their $100,000. That's what they're owed. But what about the excess money? That excess money will be paid to the borrower, to the mortgagor. The lender doesn't enrich themselves, can't enrich themselves with that excess money. So that $25,000 excess in our example belongs to the borrower, to the property owner, to the mortgage or. 
So that's number one. Now there's always a pretty dependable bidder. That dependable bidder is the lender because the lender is owed, in our example, $100,000. So the lender would step in typically and buy or bid the $100,000 that they're owed and wind up taking the property for the amount owed. And that's not uncommon. Commonly, we see no bids on foreclosure sales. Let's say we have a $200,000 value on the property, but the first mortgage is $180,000. Well, how many investors out there are going to pay $180,000 for a property worth $200,000, especially when there's probably some fix-up to be done and so on? So in this situation, it's pretty rare that you'll have bidders. So what will happen is the lender will typically bid in what the lender is owed, in this case $180,000. That's co commonly called the credit bid because the lender has that much credit going into the sale. So the lender bids that in. Nobody else bids. The lender winds up then with that sheriff's certificate of sale. The lender will wait the six months. The lender will wind up owning the property and then resell it as a foreclosure property. So the lender gets that sheriff's certificate. Next possibility is what if the bid is insufficient? So similar situation, $200,000 value, let's say the first mortgage is $200,000, but nobody's willing to pay that, and the lender doesn't even want to bid in the credit bid. They just rather get this over with and take their losses. So in that circumstance, let's say the high bidder bids $175,000. In that circumstance now, we have a deficiency of $25,000. And the lender could possibly go back into court and ask the judge to issue a judgment, to levy a judgment against the borrower for that $25,000. If the judge does that, it's referred to as a deficiency judgment. And we'll talk more about deficiency judgments a little bit later on in this, in this lesson. So that kind of concludes our discussion on mortgages, and the next voluntary lien that we're going to talk about is a deed of trust, also called a trust deed. Either one, deed of trust or trust deed. Why trust deeds? Why do we even have something other than a mortgage? Well, the answer is quite simple. What a deed of trust will do is allow a lender to foreclose without going to court. And it's a much shorter process and a much less expensive process. So what do you think? If you're a lender and you have the option to go judicial foreclosure, go to court, or non-judicial foreclosure, not go to court, where it's going to be less expensive and a shorter process, what are you going to do? In almost all instances, you're going to go non-judicial. Now, Deeds of Trust came into Arizona in 1973. And shortly thereafter, basically all lenders disregarded mortgages, no longer used mortgages, but started using deeds of trust. And today, basically mortgages are not used. Only deeds of trust are used here in Arizona with a few exceptions. So why do we even cover mortgages? Well, the reason we cover mortgages is because the mortgage is the basis for the judicial foreclosure. But now we're going to talk about deeds of trust. And a deed of trust also has two documents. It has a promissory note, and it also has not a mortgage, but a trust deed or a deed of trust. In fact, if you own a home and have borrowed some money to buy that home, I'm willing to bet that if you go into your important papers, you will not see a mortgage. What you will see is it'll say deed of trust on the top. All right, so let's talk about what these things are all about. Again, you have a promissory note, just like in a mortgage, and you have a deed of trust with, which secures the note with the property. So the deed of trust basically says, if you don't pay the money on the note, that the lender has the right to foreclose. Now, who are the parties to this deed of trust? A little bit different here. We don't have a mortgage or a mortgagee because we don't have a mortgage. Now we have a trustor. The trustor under a deed of trust is the borrower, and only the trustor signs the deed of trust. And then we have a beneficiary. The beneficiary is the lender under a deed of trust. The lender receives the benefits of this deed of trust, so he or she or the bank is called the beneficiary. 
And then we have a third party. This third party is known as the trustee. Now here we have an OR, trustor, and an EE, trustee. So something's being given and taken here, given and received. We'll talk about what it is in just a minute. So remember though, the three parties to a deed of trust are the trustor, the borrower, the beneficiary, the lender, and this third party trustee. Now, what happens here is the trustor, when he or she signs that deed of trust, gives what we're going to define here as the power of sale, also called the legal title, also called the bare legal title. The trustor gives that to the trustee. The trustor is giving one of the rights of ownership to this trustee. The trustor retains all the other rights, the right to live there, the right to sell it, the right to lease it, the right to encumber it. But there's this one right that's given over to the trustee, and we call that the legal title, bare legal title, or power of sale. And you'll see why in a minute. So let's take a look at who the parties are. We have a trustor, a beneficiary, that's the lender, and we have this third party trustee. So the trustor signs the note and deed of trust and it gives it to the lender, to the beneficiary. The power of sale at the same time that one right is given by the trustor to the trustee. Again, you'll see why in a minute. It's also called naked title, legal title, or bare legal title, a lot of different names for this thing. The trustor makes the monthly payments to the lender. The trustee doesn't receive any payments. The trustor makes the monthly payment to the beneficiary, but you'll notice the beneficiary will instruct the trustee to do something, but only in one of or two circumstances. The first circumstance in which the beneficiary will instruct the trustee is if the borrower pays it off. The second circumstance is if the borrower defaults. So let's take a look and see what happens here. If defeasance occurs, Remember, defeasance is payoff. The document that has to be given to the borrower is called a deed of reconveyance. So here's what happens. You've made your final payment to the lender, to the beneficiary. The beneficiary then must instruct the trustee to deliver the deed of reconveyance to the trustor. Why is it called a deed of reconveyance? Because initially the trustor gave this, signing this trust deed gave this bare legal title to the trustee. The trustee now has to reconvey that bare legal title back to the trustor. That's why it's called a deed of reconveyance. The trustee gives it to the trustor and it has to be delivered within 30 days of payoff, same as a satisfaction of mortgage. And it of course should be recorded. The, it's the borrower's responsibility to record this. Now, in actual fact, in real world terms, oftentimes the lender actually records it, but it is the borrower's responsibility to record it. And if that deed of reconveyance is not recorded, guess what? That, that deed of trust, that lien is still of record. So check to see in your own files if you've paid off a loan in recent times, check to see if that deed of reconveyance was recorded. Next question. What happens if the deed of trust is in default? Well, in this circumstance, the lender actually has two choices, two options. Guess what the first one is? It's judicial foreclosure. So the lender in a deed of trust, the beneficiary in a deed of trust, if he or she chooses, can actually foreclose judicially, exactly the same way as we talked about with a mortgage foreclosure. So in your course material, it's the same steps that would be followed in order to foreclose a deed of trust judicially as we described in a mortgage judicial foreclosure. But the second option is the non-judicial foreclosure. In other words, have the trustee who's been given that bare legal title, have the trustee foreclose. And the trustee can do that without going to court. Now, before we go forward here, I want to make one other point. And the point is that when the borrower gives the trustee that bare legal title, the borrower holds what is referred to still as equitable title. The borrower keeps all the other rights of ownership, which we define here as equitable title. So in your notes, 
all right, the trustor, all right, who holds the ownership of the property, holds what is called this equitable title. Make a note of that if you don't see it there in your notes. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about this non-judicial foreclosure under the trustee's power of sale. First step, the beneficiary, not having received the payments, will instruct the trustee to begin the foreclosure. Then the trustee records, next step, is to record what's called a notice of default and trustee sale. That's the actual name of the document. Now you might compare this to the judicial foreclosure. In the judicial foreclosure, what happened was you had to go to court. Here there's no court action. Here the trustee reaches into her file, she fills out a form called a notice of default and trustee sale and records that at the county recorder's office. Also, the trustee then, next step, is to send a notice to the trustor. They must send notice, certified return receipt, to the trustor within five days. Also, take a look there, there's no acceleration of the debt. In a judicial foreclosure, the debt is completely accelerated. In a non-judicial foreclosure of a deed of trust, there's no acceleration of the debt. So, what happens? Well, the law says that the trustor, the borrower, has up to nine, has at least 90 days during which time to reinstate themselves in the property. What does that mean, this right of reinstatement? Basically, it means that they have the right to bring the payments current, plus pay foreclosure costs and any penalties. But instead of having to pay the whole thing off, because the debt is not accelerated, the borrower has the right to reinstate themselves in the property. So make a distinction here between right of reinstatement, bringing the payments current plus paying foreclosure costs, and right of redemption. Now the law says the borrower has at least 90 days. But on the 91st day, the trustee's sale, the public auction of the property, could be held. So that trustee's sale, the bidding is very similar to what we described in a judicial foreclosure. And at that trustee's sale, the property is sold to the highest bidder. And a trustee's deed, sometimes called also a trustee's deed upon sale, is delivered to that bidder. Now, careful here because at this particular point, the bidder owns the property. There is no redemption for the property owner once that sale is over and the trustee's deed is delivered to the bidder. So big difference here. Remember in a judicial foreclosure, we had what? A six month statutory right of redemption. Here we have no right of redemption after the sale. I know one time many years ago, I held a deed of trust lien on a property. I was the high bidder at the foreclosure sale. That was at 11 o'clock. The trustee gave me the trustee's deed by noon. I recorded it and at two o'clock, the property was vacant. At two o'clock, I was at the property with a locksmith changing the locks. I owned the property that day. So there's no redemption for the borrower after the trustee's sale. Let's compare this redemption after the trustee's sale or the fact that there isn't any. Again, I want to emphasize reinstatement means to bring the payments current plus foreclosure costs, whereas redemption implies paying the entire debt after the sale. And in a deed of trust non-judicial foreclosure, there is no right of redemption. In a deed of trust judicial foreclosure, which would be the same as a mortgage, there is a right of redemption because we don't have this non-judicial foreclosure. Now, the bidding at a trustee sale is the same as the sheriff sale. So if there's excess money bid, it goes to the borrower. If the, uh, oftentimes the lender will bid in the credit bid and the lender will wind up owning the property. Or if there's a a deficiency, a shortage in the bidding, the lender might be able to get a deficiency judgment. A little bit confusing? Yeah, I'm sure. Here's something that might help. Terminology-wise, a trust deed means deed of trust. So deed of trust and trust deed are synonymous. The trust deed conveys this power of sale to the trustee, conveys this legal title to the trustee. The trustee with that legal title has the right to go ahead and foreclose non-judicially if and when the beneficiary instructs the trustee to do so. 
The power of sale is also called this naked legal title, bare legal title, legal title, a lot of different names. The trust deed or deed of trust is a lien instrument, remember. It creates a lien on the property. The trustee's sale, that's the non-judicial foreclosure process available under a deed of trust. And the trustee's deed, trustee's deed, is the deed which conveys ownership to the bidder at the trustee's sale. Sometimes that's also referred to as a trustee's deed upon sale. So this deed of trust legislation, which came into effect in 1973, changed the landscape quite a bit. As I mentioned previously, all lenders use deeds of trust here in Arizona. And in 99% of the situations, they foreclose non-judicially. It's pretty rare, actually, that you'll see a judicial foreclosure in Arizona. Uh, and we're not going to go into why, the, why these judicial foreclosures don't occur in this particular session. Okay, let's recap this. The three parties to a deed of trust are the trustor, the beneficiary, and the trustee. The trustor, the homeowner, executes the note and trust deed to the bank, to the beneficiary, and makes monthly payments to the beneficiary. Simultaneously and under the law, the trustor actually, by signing the deed of trust, conveys what's called legal title or bare legal title to the trustee and the trustor retains what's called equitable title. When the trustor pays off the loan, the beneficiary, the bank, has to instruct the trustee to then issue what is known as the deed of reconveyance to the trustor. This reconveys that bare legal title, and the trustor should record the deed of reconveyance to terminate the deed of trust from the public records. So what happens when the borrower stops making the payments and goes into default? Well, the bank will typically instruct the trustee to foreclose, and the trustee will do so through a non-judicial foreclosure at the trustee's sale. The third in our series of voluntary liens is a land contract. Now, this has a lot of different names. It's called a land contract, a contract for deed, a contract for the sale of real estate, a vendor's lien. They're all pretty much the same thing. And I want to emphasize that it's not only for land. It can be for any and all types of real estate. Many years ago, when it was pretty hard to get bank financing, a lot of times buyers and sellers had to do the financing on their own. So I, as a seller, might find you as a buyer and say, well, yeah, I'd like to sell you my property. And you say, well, fine, but I can't give you the full price. I can only give you a small down payment now, and I'll pay you the balance over a period of time. And so what we would do is we would enter into a contract for the sale of real estate where you would agree to pay me a price, let's say $100,000, give me $10,000 down, and pay me the balance over a period of time. But I wouldn't give you the deed right away. I would hold the deed or possibly deposit it with an escrow company with instructions that when you paid me the final payment that they were to give you the deed. So in essence, in a land contract, it's a contract for the sale of real property where the seller does not deliver the deed to the buyer until such time as the full purchase price has been paid. So let's look at the documents here. Now, in a note and mortgage or a note and deed of trust, we have two documents. We have a note and a mortgage or a note and a deed of trust. Here we only have one document. That's the land contract. That contract serves as the contract for sale. It states, I'm going to sell you the property under this price and this terms. But also it would get recorded typically, and it serves as a lien instrument, in essence, on the property. But... You as the buyer, if you do not record this, then I still appear to be the owner of record. So it's in your best interest as the buyer to record the contract to evidence your rights in the property to the rest of the world. Now, years ago, there was a big fraudster here in Arizona named Ned Warren who sold a lot of property multiple times, uh, and he sold them on on unrecorded land contracts. So if the buyer didn't record the land contract, Ned Warren still uh, seemed to be the, or was the owner of record, so he could sell it a second time and a third time and a fourth time. 
because he didn't deliver title insurance to these people. So in a transaction that you might be involved in with a land contract, the, you don't have to worry about it because the title insurance company and the escrow company will make sure that the documents are recorded and title insurance delivered to the purchaser. Now, don't, you're not going to find yourself in all likelihood in transactions with land contracts because they're rarely used today. And they are strictly a contract between the buyer and the seller. So the parties to a land contract are the vendor, the seller, you might consider the seller a lender here, and the vendee, the buyer, who owes the seller the balance of the price, so you might consider the buyer to be a borrower. But really it's a seller and buyer, a vendor and a vendee. And again, in most circumstances you, where seller financing was involved, you wouldn't actually be using a land contract today. They're rarely used. Uh, you would probably use what's called a seller carryback note and deed of trust. So, but the parties to a land contract are the vendor, the seller, the vendee, the buyer. And the vendor gives the ven vendee certain rights in the property under the contract. The buyer takes over possession of the property, the buyer lives there or uses the property, can further encumber it, can sell it, and so on. The difference is that at payoff, remember defeasance as we've been referring to it, at payoff, the deed is then delivered to the vendee. So the vendee, the buyer, records the deed, and that, that then terminates that contract of sale. Now, there is a possibility that the seller would deliver the deed to the buyer earlier than that, earlier than payoff, but that's pretty rare. But just make a note for yourself, the parties can agree to exchange the deed at any time. If there's still a balance left on the purchase price, usually what they'll do is they will uh, terminate the land contract but execute a note and deed of trust from the buyer to the seller for that remaining balance. Now what happens if the land contract is in default? Well guess what? The seller actually has two choices here. The seller can go through a judicial foreclosure, same as in a mortgage. So this is why we talked about judicial foreclosure at the very beginning because judicial foreclosure is common to mortgages, to deeds of trust, to land contracts. It's an option available on all three. So the lenders or the sellers are unlikely to do that. All right. What the seller is likely to do is go through what is called a forfeiture action, a non-judicial action. And this forfeiture action is actually a private action between the buyer and the seller where the seller is trying to take the property back from the buyer. So there is no public auction. There's no sale on the steps of the county courthouse to, with a forfeiture. And make a note for yourself here, forfeiture is unique to land contracts. You don't have forfeiture in a mortgage. You don't have forfeiture in a deed of trust. Forfeiture only applies to land contracts. So there's no public auction. So this is a private action again where the seller tries to forfeit the buyer out of the property and take the property back. So the seller must give the buyer under law certain grace periods within which to reinstate, in other words, bring the payments current. So maybe the buyer's three or four or five months behind. The seller finally says, okay, I'm going to forfeit you out. Well, the seller must notice the buyer and give the buyer a certain amount of time. That time depends upon how much of the purchase price the buyer has paid to the seller on the contract. So if the buyer has paid less than 20% of the purchase price, the seller has to give the buyer a minimum of 30 days. If the buyer has paid between 20 and 30%, the seller has to give them 60 days. If it's between 30 and 50%, 120 days, so it goes from 30, doubles to 60, doubles to 120, and then if it's 50% or more, nine months. So these are the grace period that a seller must give a buyer in a forfeiture of a land contract by law. These are stated by law. They cannot agree to shorter time periods. These are the minimum time periods the seller must give to the buyer. Now after the grace period expires, the seller then proceeds with some other steps to complete the forfeiture. We're not going to talk about those steps at this particular point in time. Now, relating to mortgages and deeds of trust and contracts for the sale of real estate, uh, there are two philosophies, two theories out there in law across the country. One is what's called lien theory, 
The other is called title theory. The question is, when you give somebody a mortgage or a deed of trust, uh, when you give a bank a mortgage or a deed of trust, does that give the bank any ownership in the property or does it just create a lien on the property, which would be the bank's personal property? And the answer is, if it's lien theory, the lender cannot have and does not hold any title, any ownership interest. In title theory states, the lender is said to hold title. Now, the lender can't live in the property or use the property, but a title theory state, the lender is thought to hold title to the property. Well, guess what Arizona is? We are a lien theory state. Arizona is a lien theory state. Lien theory means that the lender holds no title to the property, simply has personal property, simply has a lien on the property. Next on our hit parade here, we're going to talk about deficiency judgments. Remember we had that situation where the property sold for less than the amount the lender was owed? Well, if it is possible in that circumstance that the lender can go into court and ask the court to levy a judgment against the borrower for that deficiency, and if they do it, it's called a deficiency judgment. So let's take our example, $200,000 in value. You've got a $200,000 first lien on the property, and the high bid is one seventy-five. dollars So the lender's out twenty-five dollars In that circumstance, then, the lender could go po possibly go into court and say, Judge, I'm out $25,000. Please levy a judgment against the borrower for that $25,000. Let's see what happens. In this circumstance, here in Arizona, and this is very specific to Arizona law, there cannot be a deficiency judgment if the property is two and one-half acres or less in size and used as a single one-family or a single two-family dwelling. Let me repeat this. No deficiency judgment if the property is two and a half acres in size or less and is used as a single one-family or single two-family dwelling. It has to meet both conditions, but this would include most homes here in Arizona. By the way, single one-family means a single family detached, or single two-family means a two-family, a duplex. So really it means two and a half acres or less and a house or a duplex. And most properties do fall into that category. Most homes will fall into that category. Now, make a note for yourself, this does not have to be owner-occupied. This works, this anti-deficiency judgment provision also applies if the house or the duplex is a rental property. So investors can use this protection as well. And during the period of the Great Recession, 2008 through 2012, and still today, uh, borrowers can, in essence, look at this as non-recourse financing. So if I had a house or owned some investment property, an investment house, and it wasn't working out for me and I didn't want it anymore, what I could do is I say, I'm walking away from this, and the lender would not have the ability to go against me for a deficiency judgment after the foreclosure. Now, we're, gonna, we're not going to spend any more time on this, but this is a very interesting aspect to Arizona law. In essence, this makes a mortgage or a deed of trust, and this really applies to deeds of trust, it makes a deed of trust non-recourse financing on properties in this category. If you have a house on three and a third acres, guess what? They could get a deficiency judgment against you. And back in 2010, I had a gentleman uh, come in the class, and he was trying to negotiate a short sale on a property that he had built, a brand new home, basically. He had built on three and a half acres. And he wanted to negotiate a short sale, but the lender was not willing to do it. Why? Because they knew his financial condition, and he was quite substantial financially, and they knew that they could get a deficiency judgment against him because the property was above two and a half acres, so they held his feet to the fire. And it wound up, he did not walk, he would have either short sold the property or maybe walked away from it, but because of the fact that he had uh, this property did not have the deficiency judgment protection, then uh, he actually just kind of kept his credit in good shape and he held on to the property until the market came back. Another interesting area relative to deficiencies is related to divorce. So let's say we have spouses uh, who finally decide to get a divorce. And let's presume that both of them had signed on the loan. In that circumstance, 
Oftentimes what happens is one spouse deeds their half interest in the property to the other spouse. So now we have a spouse with a house and a spouse without the house. But they don't refinance. The spouse with the house doesn't refinance. And let's say two years later, the spouse with the house stops making the mortgage payments on the property for whatever the reason. Guess what? Since the lender did not release the spouse without the house from the liability on the debt, the spouse without the house's credit is going to be affected. And if the end result was a foreclosure and a deficiency judgment, that deficiency judgment not only could be levied against the spouse with the house, but also against the spouse without the house. So take a look at your notes. The quit claim deed given in the divorce by the spouse without the house to the spouse with the house does not relieve the grantor, the spouse without the house, of liability on the loan. And a deficiency judgment, if the property did, was not protected against deficiency judgments, a deficiency judgment could be levied. Wow, that's kind of interesting. What's the moral to that story? Well, if someone's getting divorced, probably a good idea to make sure the spouse that gets the house refinances it at that time. That way, this situation would not occur. Next thing we want to talk about briefly is bankruptcy. What's the effect of bankruptcy on a foreclosure? Well, all we're going to say here is that bankruptcy is going to stop a foreclosure in its track. So, what happens sometimes at the very last minute, at the 89th day in a deed of trust non-judicial foreclosure, is sometimes we see the borrower filing bankruptcy to stop the foreclosure, buy some more time, and maybe renegotiate the debt. So all we need to know about bankruptcy and its effect on foreclosure is that it will stop the foreclosure because the law does not allow any of these foreclosure actions or other lawsuits to go ahead against the person in bankruptcy. Next possibility in a foreclosure or a default situation is instead of going through a foreclosure, the lender might accept what is known as a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So let's say you're the lender and I'm the borrower, and you're beginning a foreclosure on me or are thinking about it, but you know, you know you're going to wind up with the property because there's the, the debt is equal to or maybe even greater than the value of the property. And in that circumstance, you're going to wind up with the property. So what I might do is give you a deed in lieu of foreclosure, a deed instead of foreclosing. And that way I walk away from the property. You don't have to foreclose and go through the trustee sale because I voluntarily give the property to you as the lender. And then you can put the property on the market and sell it and try to recover what you are owed. So that's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. The last thing we want to talk about here is foreclosure with multiple liens. In other words, two or more deeds of trust on the property, plus taxes, let's assume. So one of the first things you need to remember is that a prior lien foreclosure, foreclosure of a first lien, will terminate subordinate liens unless there's excess money from the sale. Secondly, junior lien holders, to protect their interest, may always cure default on prior liens. In other words, they can bring the payments current or pay off the prior lien in order to protect their lien right in the property. Third thing is that foreclosure of a junior lien does not deliver the property free and clear to the bidder. Foreclosure of a junior lien delivers the property to the bidder subject to the prior liens on the property. So if we were foreclosing a second mortgage lien or second deed of trust lien, right, the foreclosure of that lien would wipe out subordinate liens. That's the first bullet point there. But the prior liens would stay intact on the property. And let me give you a few examples of this. Earlier in, the, in this whole course, we talked about uh, three different properties and, and how liens might be placed on them. I'm going to, only going to talk about here the green property, the one with the mortgage and some $5,000 in property taxes on it. And you might recall from that session that Joe had loaned you money on the 23rd, $70,000, but didn't record his lien until the 26th, whereas Sue loaned you some money, uh, $25,000 on the 24th, after Joe loaned you the money, but uh, she recorded her mortgage, her deed of trust, Let's assume it's a deed of trust, but I may be using the term mortgage here, uh, on the 25th. So 
Sue actually has the first position lien, Joe the second. Taxes, of course, always being number one. Well, let's see, what if the tax lien is foreclosed? We will learn in another lesson that tax lien foreclosures can wipe out subordinate liens. So if the tax lien is foreclosed, the first or the second lien holder, either, either one of them will have to be notified and they can step in and pay the taxes. But if they don't, the first or second lien holders would be wiped out if the tax lien is not paid. So what would happen here? The tax lien holder would wind up owning the property just with the 5000 just for the $5,000 that they were owed in the taxes because the first mortgage lien and the second mortgage lien would be wiped out. They had the opportunity to cure the default and pay the taxes, but they didn't do it. So the tax lien holder then winds up with property A free and clear just for the $5,000. Very rare, very rare that that would happen. Second possibility, what if the first lien holder the first deed of trust for the $25,000, that's Sue. What if she foreclosed her lien? And let's assume that nobody bid, and let's assume that the second lien holder did not step in and cure the default. The second lien holder could step in and cure the default, either pay off the 25 or probably bring the payments current by reinstating it. Well, assuming the second lien holder did not do that, the second lien holder, as it says there, would be wiped out if the first loan default is not cured, but the property taxes would remain in effect. So let's assume that Sue, let's assume there's no third party bidder here, but Sue, the first lien holder, bids in her credit bid of $25,000. She would wind up owning the property for the $25,000 she was owed. The second lien would be wiped out and she would still owe the $5,000 in property taxes on the property, okay? So again, keep in mind, prior liens stay intact, subordinate liens are wiped out if they don't cure the default. Third possibility, the second lien forecloses. So the second lien holder, Joe, has not been getting his monthly payments. He steps in, begins a trustee sale, and what he would be doing is foreclosing that lien just for the $70,000 that he's owed. So bidder comes in, bids the $70,000, or Joe comes in, bids the $70,000 that he's owed, bids in his credit bid. What will happen is he would own the property, but the taxes and the first deed of trust lien of $25,000 would still be on the property. So in essence, he would then have paid seventy dollars plus $25,000 plus five. He would have paid $100,000 for the property. So then Joe winds up owning the property subject to the $5,000 in taxes and the $25,000 first loan. So to recap here with voluntary liens and foreclosures, we have three voluntary liens. We have a mortgage, which only allows judicial foreclosure. We have a deed of trust, which allows either judicial or non-judicial foreclosure. Or we have a contract for sale of real estate, a land contract, which allows judicial foreclosure or forfeiture, another non-judicial process. Well, that does it for our discussion here on voluntary liens and foreclosures.